In today's show, I'm going to take a serious look at one of the applications of Jujigatami, what I call the head roll Jujigatami. So if you want to know more about stretching a guy's arm, stick around. Hi, everybody. I'm Steve Scott, and welcome to another episode of Freestyle Judo. Hey, today we have a, a little different show today um, in terms of doing some trivia. We're going to get to that pretty quick, actually. Uh, but really, like I said in the tease, I'm going to take a serious look at uh, the head roll application of Jujigatami. It's one of my favorite ways to do Jujigatami, and I think that's across the board. A lot of people have the same opinion. It's a very popular application. It's a rolling application of Jujigatami, as a lot of you know. So um, we're going we're to take us. We're going to parse it down. We're going to break it down and take a real look at uh, how to do it and with a high high degree of success. So that'll come a little bit later in the show. But right now, uh, I want to do. Uh, a new segment. Instead of doing a Q&A this time, uh, I want to do a little judo trivia. I am a geek on trivia. I love trivia. And I think it, it, trivia is a fun thing to do because it, it helps you learn more about whatever subject you're interested in. Okay. So, or maybe not interested in, but it's, it's, it's fun to know some trivia. And I, I use judo trivia a lot. I used to use it a lot when I was coaching kids. And we made a game out of it. It was a lot of fun for the kids to do, and it taught them some the history of judo, jujitsu, um, taught them you know different nomenclature. So it was a lot of fun to do. So I used it as a teaching tool, but I also like to do it myself, and I'm going to do it on the show today. I have two questions, two questions, and I'm going to pose them to you at first here, and then at the back end of the show to keep you watching. It's a you know we want you to keep watching, but. Uh, the, the back end of the show, I will reveal the answers. So uh, here's the first question. And the first question, uh, they're both about the uh, history of judo. So some historical questions here. So the first one is this. Um, when did Professor Jigoro Kano actually start the Kodokan, actually start Kodokan judo? What, what was the date? Okay, four, four possibilities. Uh, one was February 1882. Another one was June 1882. Another one is October 1882. And the other one is actually, it wasn't in 1882. It was really in 1883. Maybe history was wrong. Okay, so something to think about, you history buffs out there. Question number two. Okay, uh, when was the first All Japan Judo Championships held? And when was the first World Judo Championships held? Okay. And, uh, you know, I think that's relevant to know from a sporting context, and it's uh, certainly part of the major history of judo. So uh, four possibilities, okay, and they'll be together. Okay, so the first answer will be the when was the All Japan Championships held, you know, and then the second part of the answer would be when was the World Championships held. So um, option A, 1899 and 1951. Option B, 1930 and 1956. Option C, 1914 and 1964. And the last possibility, your D, would be 1883 and 1906. So there are four possibilities of each of those uh, questions. So that's a bit on the judo trivia. And we'll be doing this from time to time because I'm a trivia buff, and it's a lot of fun for me to do, and I hope it is for you to do as well. I want to get now to talking about a subject. I think it's a rather obscure, but I think it's interesting. And it is uh, Kogi and Kyogi Judo. And what are they? Uh, I first heard about this when I was a, a younger, much younger, and I'm a big fan of Don Dreger. Uh, he was a, a major historian and expert and, and teacher of, uh, started with Judo, and he expanded to a lot of Japan, it's about all the Japanese martial arts that I know of, and certainly then into other Asian martial arts. He's written numerous books on a variety of subjects on um, judo as well as um, the Asian martial arts of different types. So he's quite a historian. It was uh, he's passed on now, and I, he was the first one to introduce to me introduce me to the concept of kogi and kyogi judo. And and I, I'm not going to talk about what they are right now. I'm going to leave that to this next segment here. It's about three and a half minutes in length, and I explain that a bit. Uh, but I think it's pertinent to know, and it helps us in our development as both in judo and certainly in martial arts. So I'm going to play that right now. So let's get to the what kogi and kyogi judo are. So here we go.
I've been heavily influenced by the writings of Don Dreger through the years, and he's really been a favorite of mine. And he is one of the leading uh, historians, and, and he, he was, he's deceased now, but he's one of the leading historians and, uh, and, and um, educators in all the martial arts. But his base was judo. And uh, he wrote quite a bit about judo, and he studied, uh, the, he, he was a Japanese, fluent Japanese speaker and reader, and he brought so much to, to all of us. So anyway, that, if anything you get by Don Dreger, I would so, certainly recommend it. But what I got out about Dreger from, from some of his teachings was he talked a lot about there are two types of judo, and he goes right back to the original writings of Jigoro Kano on this. There is a kogi judo and a kyogi judo. Kogi and Kyogi. Let's look at those phrases. Kogi Judo is uh, Judo in a wider sense. It's a broader sense. Uh, Kogi means it's, it's agreeable. It's the agreeable form of Judo to Jigoro Kano. And Dreger wrote, again, going back to a lot what Don Dreger wrote about this, as well as Kano himself, was it's, um, it, it's, it's Judo in a broader sense. It's a broader aspect. It's, it's a wider look of, 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 it's an appreciation of Judo for its totality. That's what it is. Not just in the physical sense of, of you know being really tough or whatever, being good at sport or self defense aspect of it, uh, but but taking the understanding and, and studying the the philosophies of it that it's a great physical education, it's a great thing for moral t character development. So it's a broader outlook of doing judo. It's it's a broader aspect of judo. It it's it's called jodan judo by some people. Judo in the upper sense, the upper levels of Judo thinking and, and doing. And that's what I try to aspire to be. You know, as a young man, I, I just pursued what was really as Kyogi Judo. And as I got older, more mature, I think this is the way for all of us. We appreciate what Judo is, then we become more in the aspirants or, you know, adherents of Kogi Judo. Now, Kyogi Judo, as I just mentioned, is Kyogi means objectionable, unagreeable. And it is judo in a very narrow sense. It's just pursuing one aspect of judo, whether it be competition, self-defense, whatever it may be. It's just one aspect, usually considered just the physical aspects of judo, but it is a judo in a narrow sense. It's not a broad look at the scope of totality of judo. And as we mature, we hope to get out of that phase of the kyogi judo phase and into the kogi judo phase. And it's also called geidan judo. Geda means a, a lower level of, of understanding of, of Judo. So that's the difference between Kogi Judo, which is a Judo in a broader sense, the totality of Judo, and, and Kyogi Judo, uh, um, Judo in a narrower sense, and just the, generally just the physical aspect of it. So that's the difference between Kogi Judo and Kyogi Judo, and I hope you aspire to attain Kogi Judo. Judo in a broader sense, a more understanding, a wider understanding of it. I really can't add anything to that, um, but I, I think it's an interesting subject. I, I really do, and it's it's one how one grows and matures um, as a human being, certainly in the practice and study of judo or any of the martial arts, whether it might may be. But I, I think um, Dreger was certainly d dead on with it, and of course, Jigoro Kano himself wrote something about this, but Kano, but, uh, but Dreger was the one who really got me interested in it. So I would, uh, I would highly recommend any of his books and they are fabulous. So, um, anyway, and I've had that graphic of the one or that, that recommendation of one of his books. So, um, on the last video, so anything by Don Gregor, by you will certainly be enhanced in your knowledge of, uh, any phase of the judo or any, any martial art. So a bit about Kogi and Kyogi Judo. So there we go. All right. I would like to uh, talk about a serious subject next, which is um, Judo burnout. <clears throat> okay, Judo burnout, um, it, martial arts burnout, no matter what it is, burnout of anything. You know, we get burned out of doing something. And years ago, I, I attended some kind of, a, oh gosh, some kind of a educational, something at one of my, the universities where I was, I was attending at the time. And they were talking about... Um, people's length of activity and any any type of activity they may be totally consumed by it and really involved in it but and this is going years ago and i don't have i can't cite any sources on this i'm just going on my own memory but i, I do remember vividly that the the average the longest time someone will not the average but the longest time someone will stay with an activity is about 15 years 
and then they go on to something else. Or they decrease their level of, of you know, passion in that activity and just make it you know, just a part-time thing and, and, and very rarely be involved with it. So 15 years. So as a coach, when I, you know, when I see someone walk in the door, you know, I've, and I've done this ever since I can remember, I'll say to my, I've said to myself, how long can we keep this guy 15 years? You know, that's my goal to keep them 15 years if I can. And so that's something to think about. Um, and if you can keep them, you know, longer, great. You know, some of us are lifers. You know, some of you watching this are just like me. I, I've been doing this stuff since 1965. I was 12 years old. So um, I, I really enjoy it. And I, I have. It's, it's, you know, been a wonderful part of my life. Uh, but let's talk about burnout now. Um, like I said, everyone does get burned out. Uh, there, there, there's a lot of talk about athletes burning out, just like what I mentioned there. You know, an athlete could burn out after a period of time, but coaches get burned out too. Coaches really get burned out. I know I've experienced it myself over the years. And I remember one time I had a, a good discussion with my great friend, Bob Corwin, who has been a coach for many, many years and very successful coach in Yorkville, Illinois. Man, I really respect deeply. And uh, we were talking about that. And he said uh, how he avoids burnout is he will um, uh, run the dojo throughout the year. And I think he closes it down uh, when, gosh, I think when um, it, it, August sometime or it's September, at some point, either August, September, and he'll close it down for a month, uh, you know, about, about a month or so. And then he'll reopen it again in, in late September, early October, whatever it may be. And the kids will back. They're not burned out, or some some. If he'll get a new crew of beginners, then it's like he starts a new school year every year. And he said that's good for him too, because that way he can uh, step away from the dojo, <clears throat> step away from all the travel and, and training he's been doing with the team, um, and not worry about lesson plans or any of the other stuff. And he can get on with some other things in life. And and uh, he found that as a valuable tool for him. And that they could be a good way for a coach to do too. That's a great recommendation, and it's one of the many ways to fight burnout. So, but we all get burned out. And um, what are some signs of burnout? How do you know if you're burned out? Well, here are some a few things that I've, you know, researched through the years, and, and here are some general signs of burnout. One is obviously lack of enthusiasm for what you're doing. If it's a drudge to go to practice, it's a drudge to go to practice. So. You're, you're burned out. Understand what's going on. Okay. Um, you excessively worry about details. Now, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that, um, you know, small things make big things happen. So small things are important. But when you excessively worry about those small things or worry about, you know, other things, when you, when you make something that is probably just, you know, not very important into a very important thing you know make a you know a mountain out of a molehill like they say when that happens that is a sign of burnout it's possibly a sign of burnout it could be just your personality too but but you know if you normally don't think about that and it's you know small things are getting on you that's a sign of burnout um you have negative actually dreams and i, I was talking with someone years ago about this about uh, how people dream and you know how you know what does that mean you know dream meaning of dreams we all probably had interest in that but when you have negative dreams about people in judo or the activity you're in um that you normally don't have negative dreams about you know the you know students you've had in the past or people you know uh unless some people just have negative dreams i guess but but if you have generally negative dreams about people or about the activity um, you know, that is a sign of burnout. Okay. Um, I, I, I had a, I, I had a fellow tell me that a coach tell me that along that line, a number of years ago, he would dream about showing up late to every practice. And when he got there, his students would chide him and insult and embarrass him for being late to practice. And that was, that was a dream that bothered him. He had that often and he was actually pretty burned out from coaching. So I think that's that's kind of an interesting thing. So, you know, again, negative dreams. Um, another thing is uh, one of the most frequent things that happens to people who are burned out in anything, but getting sick frequent getting sick frequently. And if you get colds a lot, if you're if you're down in the dumps a lot and it's being sick, um, yeah, you, you you might be burned out. So, you know, being sick, you know, like, like people who are sick of their jobs, they, they call in frequently and they, they, they probably really are sick. Well, they're sick of their jobs, but they are sick of what they're doing. And so, yeah, it manifests itself physically. So that's another sign that you are burned out. So what are things we can do? Like 
some cures as it well, or some, some how to resolve it to some degree. Just like I mentioned about Bob Corwin before, you know, he, he planned his year out. So he did have a, you know, about a month break, which was a great idea. You might want to think about doing that in your own, in your own t- coaching, if you're a coach or your own training for, you know, your own training program, if you're an athlete or a student. <clears throat> All right. But in this case, take short but not long breaks okay so you know and certainly not long breaks so you might take a short break so if you if you run everything through the year you don't take that month off like bob corwin does um but you you run your program throughout the year you might have to say okay every so often um i'm going to get out of town and just go do something that i enjoy take a weekend off um you know take a little vacation once in a while not a long one a short one that you won't be missed at the dojo. Your team won't miss you. <clears throat> your students won't miss you. Uh, that you know, but except for a few days, and frequent breaks like that uh, will keep you fresh. Okay, and, and don't even think about judo, jiu-jitsu, samba, whatever it may be. Just just go enjoy sightseeing, whatever it may be. Just a frequent break. So that's that's one thing. But don't take long breaks. You know, don't don't stay away for you know several weeks at a time. Because then you may not want to come back, or people may not want you back. But that's something you, you better so, – so time them, time the break short and make them sweet. All right. Um, another thing that I found that kept, kept me going uh, and certainly did work for me uh, is develop a specific interest in something. And w- one of those things was writing books. Uh, years ago, I was, I was coaching, and I was doing a pretty good job, I think, and, and we had a good program. Um, but I wanted to add to it. And I was getting a little bored just showing up and coaching all the time. And so I said, well, I, you know, I'd like to take a step back and uh, write some books. You know, I, I seem to have a little bit of talent in that to some degree, people told me. So, uh, you know, I enjoyed writing. I wrote a lot of articles for different magazines and stuff. So I stepped back and, and that helped me a lot. I, I wrote some books and I still do that. I still do that. Uh, another thing is another, you know, so, so you kind of stay in the game. Do it with a, you know, do a different part of the game. Like I said, write a book, uh, do YouTube videos. You know, keep keep your interest up. You know, uh, do some research in a different area. Um, one thing my, my my good friend John Saylor did was uh, he's he got really involved in self defense and he's really good at it. He he's tremendously in his shingitai jiu jitsu. So he just didn't just you know train grapplers or or you know judo guys. He got into the area of self defense. Uh, which is infinitely interesting to him, and it is, is a very interesting field. And he's found that's kept him fresh for a lot of a lot of years. He really enjoys that. So it's another adjunct to his main body of work in judo and jiu-jitsu. So that's how he handled it, and he c- still continues to do that, and he's good at it. So you might be that. That's what I'm saying. You might be have something, some area that wasn't maybe an interest early on, but you can develop an interest and in, in, you know and add that. It's like you say, well, geez, you're adding more work to it. Well, you may be, but it's a different kind of work. It's a still same subject, but it's a different kind of work in that subject. So uh, that, that that's another way of looking at it. And another way is um, on, on a weekly or daily basis, uh, cut back your time on the mat. Okay, um, if, if you're, say, you're an athlete training and you're on the mat all the time, and even when you're training, you're training hard, even when you're, you know, not training, you know, even the time off from a competition or something like that, or you come to practice five nights a week, uh, you may be there too much. You know, you, you may, be, may not be there, but too much. You may need that much practice. But, but if you want to keep from getting burned out, maybe step away from the mat a little bit, just one, or night, one night less a week or something like that may be quite helpful. If you're a coach, um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're coaching five nights a week, or five times a week and maybe doing some private lessons on top of that. Maybe you should cut back and, and you let, you know, schedule some other type of activity in there, you know, some other coach doing some other martial art or um, um, have one of your assistant instructors fill in uh, for that class. You know, it's a good way to teach a young coach to come up. So that's a way to do it. So, you know, back off a little bit. You know, on a regular basis on the mat, it may actually help. You know, uh, sometimes they say less is more, and this could be a good case in that situation. So, so that's a, that's a brief look at burnout. And I discuss this again, a shameless plug. Uh, effect is, I, I have my book here, but I'll, I'll, I'll flash it up here. Let me flash up the uh, book, uh, Teaching on the Mat. Let's do that right now.
And in my book, uh, Teaching on the Mat, which is really kind of an extension of my first book, Coaching on the Mat, then Winning on the Mat, and now Teaching on the Mat, it's, it's a small little book on, uh, I think, 18 different subjects of coaching. And one of them is coach burnout. And uh, so I discussed that in some of the stuff in the book and, um, you know, it might be interesting to you. So if you want to get teaching on the mat, it is, uh, there it is on our, uh, uh, we, we have that at our welcome mat store. So it's not expensive at all. And it's certainly worth it. Let's get on to head roll jujigatami. I love jujigatami. If you've watched any of my videos or read my books, you know, it's my favorite technique. And uh, not just because it's my favorite technique, we covered a lot. Well, I guess it is, but I'll be honest about it. But um, it's um it's a very effective technique. It's a very effective skill. And I believe there are four core applications. If you've seen my other show on that, uh, the, the four core, the basic applications of Jujigatami, this is one of them. Uh, the first one is uh, the head, or the uh, spinning Jujigatami. Second one is the uh, back roll Jujigatami. Third one is the head roll Jujigatami. And the fourth one is the hip roll Jujigatami. And these, these different applications, the names of them, uh, describe what they do. Obviously, in the head roll Jujigatami, you're rolling your opponent over his head onto his back and stretching his arm with Jujigatami. Uh, no matter what the sport it is, whether it's judo, sambo, jiu-jitsu, mixed martial arts, you name the combat sport it's done in, uh, this is a, a very effective uh, and popular uh, variation or application of the Jujigatami, the, the cross-body arm lock. So today, what I want to do is parse these out. Parse, parse, or parse head roll Jujigatami out anyway into four, five uh, little segments here, uh, video segments on doing it. Uh, so in this first one, it's going to be an introduction. And I want to warn you, the, uh, the first 20, 30 seconds of it, there's no sound. It's just the guys doing it. And then we get into teaching it and, and talking about it. So uh, let's just watch this first video. It's about two and a half minutes long. So it's introduction to Jujigatami. He's going to be low, okay? So, or he may be just on elbows and knees looking for an opportunity. Derek is whatever, snapped him down, knocked him down, whatever. Here we are, okay? Now, what he's going to do, he's going to get to the side. Now, everybody watch. He's got some control. He may even pop him up a little bit to you know, lift him up to make an open. Cool, all right? Now, what's going to happen is he's going to step over with his right foot, and he's going to anchor his right foot on the left hip. Now, it's really an important thing. As he anchors that foot on the left hip, he comes on the very top of his head. And look, if you were looking at this, this would be an L shape, okay? He's not angled wide, he's L shaped. See that? Anchor foot on the hip or high leg, okay? Top of the head, it's important. Don't go on one side or the other. If he goes like on one, just on one shoulder, that's, he's, he's stuck there. Boom, oh, he's in trouble now. By posting on your head, you have a, a vision of your opponent. You see what he's doing, plus, you're posting on your head, you're balanced. Now, got that. Now look at his left arm. He's chopping in. Part of that movement, and the rolling movement's gonna depend on him really popping that left arm on leg right arm. Okay? Now, so that so far so good. Now, the right foot, the, the shin, the you know, the top of the foot area, is gonna go across the back of the neck. See how that is? Very compact. I like to say stay around. Here he's staying around, isn't he? Now, so he's got him set to go. With his right arm, he can hook the leg, grab the ankle, whatever he has, it is a handle. And now see how he's in a tight, not tight in a bad way, compact, round little ball. He's gonna roll the bottom man over, kick right over, and guess what? He's got Juju Gatami going. And I do want to thank uh, uh, the, the guys at the Sambo Summit for uh, for being in that video in that, that section there. It's uh, uh, they were a great bunch of guys. We did that with Derek and I did the Sambo Summit with him. It's Steve Kepfer and crew were just great guys. So uh, thanks to them for letting us do the video there. Um, now the second section is about two minutes long. 
And in it, we're going to be discussing um, how to use your legs. Okay, the legs are really important in doing Jujigatami and what I call an anchor foot. And you'll see what I mean if you, when you watch this. So uh, well, let's, let's, without further ado, let's get into this little two-minute segment about using your legs in controlling your opponent with Jujigatami. We have to pop Eric open a little bit, drag him open. There's, he's created a hole. That's a good way to set him up. See how he grabbed the belt with the nape of the neck there and pulled him open, okay? That's a good way to create that hole. But now, look at Derek's position. Now, here's where we're getting precise, okay? This is where we're going to be. See how he is to the side here? He's going to be stepping his leg over, and when he does, he wants to be very specific about threading that foot. Sandy, come on around here. He's going to thread his left leg the leg closest to, to his opponent's hip. That's what we're going to thread through. Now look how he does that. He anchors right here. That's really important. Because if you don't anchor and control his leg, you're controlling his hips now. There's important parts though, and the, the things that Steve points out, there's a reason why he's saying that. That resting on the top of your head, not on your shoulder, and then getting that foot hook, or that, that foot hook in the hip. If you don't have that, you're not across, his, his waistline, his belt line, you don't have control of the hips anymore. So when you turn a big guy over, he ain't going. That's when they just go, Ugh. and you're like, I hate this move. I, it doesn't work. I don't know what they're talking about. It's because you don't have the leverage across his hips. Show sure, that sure, what you mean. Because so, which I do. when I step through, that foot immediately comes through and hooks, hooks his hip right there. Should if, be able to balance yourself. If my foot's here or down here, I have no control of his hips anymore. It's going to be all about the pressure I exert up here. And then it's it's an almost equal battle, okay, because it's one leg versus his shoulders. But if I bring it back up here to his hip, I've got control of his hips now. It takes his legs completely out. And you'll notice I just turned my hips over, I pointed my shin that way like this, and it flips his hips right over, okay? You're just using physics to flip the guy over, that's it. Don't make it hard on yourself. All right, I can't stress the importance of those legs, of how you control with your legs and how you um, manipulate your opponent with your legs. So a lot of people, when they study Jujigatami, don't think about that. And I think that's, again, I'm saying this from experience in teaching Jujigatami to a lot of people in a lot of training camps, seminars, and, and just practices. Uh, they don't think about that. So it's something that is, is really considered using your legs, very important aspect of it. Uh, this third video, a little over two minutes long, and we're going to be talking about three key points in Jujigatami, in head roll Jujigatami. Um, one is the angle of attack that you make on him, okay, when he's on elbows and knees. And often your opponent will be on elbows and knees or turtled up, and, and, and you know, we could pop him open, do various things to do that. But, but the first thing is your angle of attack, and you want to create an L shape, and I discussed that in this video. The second thing is how you control his arm that you're attacking, how you chop and trap it. And you'll see what I mean when you, when you see the video here. And the third thing, I think fundamentally important, and another big mistake people make, is they do not post on the top of their head. Okay, that's very important to post on the top of your head for two primary reasons. One is you, it gives you stability. It's a base, a great, very stable base. Your head is the top of your head and not the side of your head. I'll, I'll explain it in the video. You'll see that. And secondly, it gives you a good field of vision, what you're doing. So by being on top of your head, so that's really important. So without further ado, let's get into this two-minute, 15-second clip on key points of head roll jujigatami. Now let's look at the position. See how Derek is sideways, almost like an L here. See this side position here? As soon as he anchors there, as soon as he puts his foot there, he immediately, with his right hand, the hand closest to his opponent's head, hooks. Now that's going to chop Eric's arm in. But watch, look, look also what Derek's doing with his other hand. He's Still posting posting. here on the mat. That's his base. He's on the very top of his head. Here's where a lot of people, 90% of the people who want to make a good Jujigatami and they don't, they screw up, here's where they screw up. They're not on top of their head. They're on one side or the other, they're on their shoulder. And if you do that, you don't have the position, number one, and, 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 and balance, able to make the roll happen, okay? If you, if you just collapsed on, say collapsed on your right shoulder. 
he's stuck. He has to go that direction. Okay? Now, he wants to go that direction eventually, but he's not in a good enough position to make it happen now. And see how I'm sliding off of him? Yeah, he's Cannon. sliding off. He's lost the move. Okay? Totally lost. Totally lost. Again. And so, so, let's look at that again. So, he, the guy's down. The guy may be balled up pretty good. So, he pops him open, opens that. Top. See how he came over there? He's specific. He filtered this through. He anchored that foot on the leg, head to the top of the head. See how he posted the head of hand. That's important to do. The other hand has hooked the arm. Now he's just chopped that in. He, he's going to take that arm. He's starting now. Watch what he did with this other foot that's coming over. See how he puts it on the back of the head? See the, his instep here. Is that the That's on the Sorry. back of the head, and he's locking the head in. Now, now he's going to roll to that hip, and as he does, he rolls him over. In this case, he didn't need to do a leg drag or anything. He just rolled him over. And when he comes over, he kicks over, and he finishes the juju. Okay? And again, I cannot stress how important being on top of your head is. You know, you saw when you collapse on one side or the other, you're stuck. You have to go that way. And that may be the way you want to roll, but... You're not, you're not set up well enough to get that roll going. You've got to be stable. And um, riding your opponent like, like you saw in that video where you cross his body like that, post it on your head, that's, that's a ride. I mean, you're, a ride is a controlling position uh, where, where you can control and manipulate your opponent. Well, that's a ride. If you know how to ride on top of your head and do that, that's a, that's a, that's a definite skill you should learn. So posting on top of your head, really important. All right, this next clip is about two and a half minutes long. And it's a very essential part of it called what, what we call the leg drag. I didn't invent that term. I don't really know where I first heard it. it may have been in Great Britain somewhere, but, um, but I know they used that phrase when I was over there in, in one of my trips to Great Britain. So leg drag. And you're dragging your leg over them. There are different ways to do it, and we show a few of them in this, in this clip here. Uh, but it is important how to – it helps roll him over onto his back. Okay, so that's what a leg drag is. So we'll uh, – I'll just we'll just watch this video. So here we go. What we're going to show guys is when you're doing like a head roll jujigatami. Um, Derek's going to do this on mic. Now watch. So he's setting him up. He's got post and everything. Now, so but the guy may like stop, you know. And so you've already turned and you haven't rolled him, all right? So what Derek's going to do with his now he's got his right hand trapping Mike's uh, left arm, so for the ready, ready for the juji. But watch what he does with his right or his, his, his left arm, Derek's left arm. He's going to reach. There's several things you can do to reach. Okay, uh, go ahead from there, Derek. Why don't you coach right. from this point? So the the important part, like Coach was saying, is you're grabbing your hip. Okay, so this is just like when we're doing the the grip break. You try and reach over on the far hip and grab that. That keeps the elbow locked into your chest, which makes it harder for him to flip out of it and pull his arm out. Okay? Plus it makes, it frees up this other hand for you to be able to reach wherever you want. You can reach through and get like the Hungarian roll grip, you know, where you're gra grabbing the back of the thigh. You can grab the back of the pants. You can grab, like meat hook the ankle, or you can reach far over and, reach and do the same thing in the far leg. Um, I think technically the, the far ankle was what Anne Maria showed us first when she showed this off. Yeah, Anne Maria DeMars. Yeah, and, and uh, she grabbed the pant leg, but you can also say in a sambo sense, since there's no pants, you can grab that ankle, just mm -hmm. like Derek's doing there. Right. Okay, now watch as he rolls, he just takes Mike with him. He rolls right over and finishes right into a juji. Okay. So the, the key here is no matter which grip you're taking, guys, we're going to go across your face. Don't try and pull him up and over like this because then I'm pulling all of his body weight over and I'm trying to lay it farther away from me, okay? I'm going to just drag him across my face like this. Just work with his ankles because those are light and manageable, okay? So again, doesn't matter which grip I take, this time I'm going to get the this near side one. I'm just going to pull across my face and turn over, okay? And as soon as I turn over, my hips are up, just collect that head, bring it back in. Again, this arm is right there ready for me. Okay? One more time. So that's what we call the uh, the leg drag because you're literally dragging his leg over. This time I'm going to grab the whole thigh, right? 
just drag it across my face, turn over, collect the head, finish up. All right, so you know, the importance of a leg drag, I think, is brought out in that video. And, and uh, again, um, look at the videos on my tube, the YouTube uh, channel we have here. Uh, I write about it in my book, Jujigatami Encyclopedia. I have a big section on leg drags. Um, other people's videos, that, you know, like, they have great videos on this subject. So, so watch them. I think that's an important element in rolling your opponent over onto his back. Okay. Uh, the last one is the finish. This is fifth fifth video on um, Jujigatami, head roll Jujigatami, is how to finish. And one thing I want to point out here, and we do a little thing here. It's, it's a little over a minute. Okay, we do a little thing in this last video. We, we pointed out there are three elements of any arm lock. And I think any type of a submission technique, really, uh, but certainly Jujigatami. The first one is you have to control your opponent, control the position, control how he moves, control your own body. So first one is control. Okay. The second one is to trap the arm, trap his arm, and um, you know don't don't let go of it. I mean you've got him hooked up. Trap it. Okay. That's the some people call it collecting the arm. Um, it goes by different names. I've always called it trapping the arm. So the first one is control. Second one is trap. Third one is to actually lever it, okay, pry it free, stretch it out, uh, crank it, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but I've, I got the phrase first from uh, Neil Adams, uh, who called it uh, a lever, and he, other people might have called it lever as well, but I first heard it from him years ago. And the, the, the explanation that he gave me was that it's, you're, you're levering his arm out straight, okay, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a it's it's a great way to describe what you're doing because it's you know it is a lever action you know against you know here's the fulcrum you know, you're pulling it, it's kind of a lever so yeah it's you're levering it out straight if calling it prying out straight that okay that's fine you want to crank it you know what if you want any application any name you want to use fine but i always thought calling it lever gave it a better explanation of what you're doing with that arm okay you're using it as a lever to you know, crank against your your fulcrum, which is your your crotch. Okay, is your is your is your pubic bone, and in jujigatami. So anyway, we're in this last one. We're just going to talk about how to finish with the jujigatami. So here we go. Got it. Kicks it over and finishes. Now, when he does finish, he starts to lever that out. Remember, guys, we we're talking earlier. There are three phases to every submission. Really, control. You control the position, you get the submission, so control. He controlled the rolling movement, didn't he? Okay? Then he got the trap. He trapped his arm to his body. Then he got the lever. He levered it out straight. Okay. Hug the arm, don't grab it. Hug it. Because now it becomes part of you. Okay? And I picked up the phrase lever from Neil Adams, the old judo chamber. And he said, don't use the word pry, use the word lever, because that's what you're doing here. You are levering it free, and you're being more accurate in that description. And I think that's a good way to look at it, too. And again, there's a lot more to be said about head roll jujigatami. This is just five brief videos on it. Um, it, it is a, a, a very interesting um, and very common and very... Um, useful uh, application of, of Jujigatami. And again, I, I classify it for, for my teaching purposes, the four basic types. Uh, this certainly is one of the most popular types. And it, it's, a, it's a longer learning curve, but to, to learn it, it, it takes a while to learn and adapt and, and become skillful at this head roll action of manipulating your opponent. But it's certainly worth the time to learn because in, in actual practice and application, it, it's very, very successful. High rate of success for the head roll jujigatami in all weight classes, both male and female. So I highly recommend it, and I hope you uh, have some good success with the head roll jujigatami. Okay, hey, let's get back to our trivia question. Let me find the questions again. We'll go over them real quickly here. Two questions on our judo trivia. Okay, first is, when did Professor Jigoro Kano start Kodokan Judo? Okay, and I gave you four options. Um, February 1882, June of 1882, October of 1882, and it wasn't really even in 1882, it was in 1883, okay? Well, if you were scratching your head and saying, well, I th I'm pretty sure it was 1882. Well, you were right, it was in 1882 uh, by all historical records, 
uh, that, that I've had access to. But it's a, here's a bit of interesting trivia. Well, let me pull something else here. Get to another note. I want to make sure I read this right so I've got more notes on this. Let's see trivia stuff. Look at this. Okay. Um, in, when Kano did start Kodokan Judo, uh, he started in February of 1882 at the Aisho Temple. And we could have this the Aishoji Temple. G means temple. Aisho Temple in, uh, in the Tokyo area. Um, it was a very small uh, temple. He started his uh, Kano School. He called it his Kano School. And it was, you know, it was an educator, you know, and it was his first really attempt at teaching. Uh, so he started a private school, and it was called the Kano School. And at the Kano School, he had a small uh, nine mat, nine mat tatami mats, you know, the smaller, t you know, the, the long, you know, three by uh, one by one meter by three meter mats uh, about. Um, he had nine of, nine of those tatamis. And uh, that was the code. He called it the Kodakan. And he named it the Kodakan school to learn the way school to learn the philosophy. Okay. But that was the start. Yes. But he formally called it Kodakan Judo in June of 1882. That's when he formally announced that uh, he wasn't just calling it jujitsu or jujitsu anymore. He was starting his own methodology called the Kodokan. So I think that's kind of interesting. So if you answered February and Ju or June, you were both right. It was both of them actually. So he started the Kano, or the, the, at the and he just called it Kano Jiu-Jitsu. I think at first I can't remember, but he, but it wasn't called Kodokan formally until June of 1882. So that's answer to question number one. It could be it was February and June. So if you answered either one, you're right. Okay. Now the next one is when was the uh, first All Japan Judo Championships and when was the first World Judo Championships? The first All Japan Judo Championships was in 1930 and the first World Judo Championships was in 1956. And that's um, significant as because judo uh, was becoming a, a sport. It was becoming a sporting activity. And, uh, you know, Professor Kano had three phases. He, he called it his three culture principle. The first one being judo's physical education. The second one being judo as a, a methodology of, of uh, moral, cultural, um, um, virtuous character development. And number third was uh, the physical aspects of judo is either self-defense or sport. Um, and that this this fulfilled them this this making it a, a sport where it was yeah, nationwide and went on to be worldwide it fulfilled the three aspects of the Kodokan judo so that's a little bit of the trivia on, on judo judo history so um, and you know um, I it's a great learning tool for kids I really think it for anybody and, and once in a while I still you know throw these questions out to the guys on the mat the adults I teach these days but uh, again you can use it for what it is, judo trivia, or just say, oh, it's just a bunch of trivia and fooey, that's good too. But So anyway, um, hey, thanks a lot for uh, watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I always enjoy doing these shows. And uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and all our Facebook platforms. We'd love to have you. And uh, we will see you next time.